And let's take our Bibles tonight, turn to Jeremiah chapter number two. Last week we started a brand new series uh, on Jeremiah, a man who stood alone. And I think that that word alone is really going to be the, the, the focus throughout this entire series. If you would take a look at verse number 32, Jeremiah chapter two, verse 32. And the, the best way to view this chapter in order to really understand where God's coming from is to view this chapter as describing a wonderful, tremendous relationship called marriage. And yet we have to look at the reality of what happened. Verse 32, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. I want to bring a message tonight. We're going to cover a lot of ground in chapter two, not, not quite every verse, but most of the verses. I want to bring a message tonight on the subject, the beginning of the end. When Tiger Woods turned pro at the age of 20, he immediately conquered the golf world like nothing that people had ever seen. In his very first year, he won three PGA tournaments. He was ranked number one in the world before the end of his first year. He then went on to dominate more than a decade where he was ranked number one for almost that entire time. By 2007, he already had an accumulated net worth of $769 million just because of his golf career. It was predicted that he would surpass $1 billion by 2010. It was in the midst of his greatest years that he married a former Swedish model. They lived in Florida. They began building a 10,000 square foot $39 million mansion. And in 2009, Tiger Woods' personal life began to unravel at the speed of gossip as the National Enquirer published an article that was accusing him of cheating on his wife. Two days later, he drove into a fire hydrant and shrubs in front of his house. And then the avalanche began with more than a dozen women stepping out publicly claiming to have had affairs with him. He and his wife were divorced the following year, and Tiger Woods moved into his new 10,000 square foot, $39 million mansion all by himself. What happened to Tiger Woods was but a shadow of what the nation of Israel had to look forward to, and it was the job of Jeremiah to be the bearer of bad news. The message was going to be simply this, it's going to be getting ugly. Tiger Woods didn't just suffer from a public relations nightmare. He lost millions of dollars in endorsements. He was forced to announce an indefinite leave of absence. And his game was never the same. He began having all sorts of physical problems while he was still try trying to rebuild his life. And the message from Jeremiah to Judah in Jerusalem was simply this. This first sermon that Jeremiah was going to preach was just the beginning of the end. Let's take a look at verse number two, Jeremiah chapter two, verse number two. Got some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is I've only got two points. The bad news is they're really long. Verse number two, the first thing tonight is this, God's people were the love of his life. God speaking through Jeremiah. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, God speaking, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness under the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. We are now going to look at something that is so amazing and that gives us a tremendous look at how God looks at things so differently than we do. 
This was Jeremiah's first recorded sermon as a prophet. And I think that it's very interesting and noteworthy to see how God chose to speak to his people. When God is getting ready to let them have it, he starts out this way. He begins to reminisce about how things used to be. We're told that God's relationship with Israel was viewed as a marriage. But when exactly did this marriage take place? Well, Israel began with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. But it was with the Exodus, their departure out of Egypt, that the Hebrew people were viewed really for the first time as a nation that had been set apart for a divine purpose. As the Hebrews left Egypt, they had no idea where in the world they were headed, and yet God did. Where was God taking his people to? The answer is not the promised land. The answer was he was taking them on their honeymoon as husband and wife. Where were they going to spend their honeymoon? Of all places, God chose his honeymoon to be in the wilderness. Hundreds of years later, God is here in this passage looking back to a very, very special time, a tender-hearted time, a time when he and his wife were never closer, a time when their marriage was never happier. In fact, the happiest time of all in Israel's history from God's vantage point was when they were locked up with him in the wilderness. And some may be thinking, but preacher, wasn't that a Wasn't that a bad time? There was a lot of murmuring, a lot of complaining about the manna. They didn't have enough water. Wasn't that a time of disappointment and failure? Just as with every marriage, there's going to be some necessary uh, adjustments to one another. And as a new bride, Israel was going to struggle initially in, in the matter of trusting her husband because her faith in him was still weak. At the early stage in this marriage, she frightened easily because she didn't see any pools of water out in the desert. At this early stage in her marriage, she was frustrated often because they were eating manna all the time. But all the while, God was enjoying himself because the more time that they spent together, the more that she loved him and the more that she trusted him. Remember at the very beginning of their journey, she didn't believe her husband, and he was telling her about this promised land place, and she wasn't too sure that he was able to protect her and from all these bad giants and all that sort of thing. And so God made a decision. Instead of going to the promised land, let's extend the honeymoon, and let's stay here for another 40 years. And the, at the end of that 40-year honeymoon, God's wife, Israel, trusted him as never before. And here's the thing. God chose to stretch his honeymoon from a short trip to the promised land to a 40-year long journey, but it was not because he was punishing his bride. It was because he wanted to spend more time with her. And so in verse 2, we're told that God remembered the kindness of her youth. What does that mean? It means a lot of young couples, when they first get married, they don't have a lot. I can remember when my wife and I first got married, we went in the Army, went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, Before she was able to come and and join me, I went out house shopping that was really kind of more of apartment shopping, and it really evolved into really cheap apartment shopping. Our first apartment cost $60 a month, and the reason was because it was a condemned building. They hadn't vacated it yet, and so we got a real good deal, cheap apartment, The heat during the wintertime in Massachusetts, the heat wasn't working all that great. 
And so when my wife went grocery shopping, we had some frozen hamburger and didn't have room in the freezer for it, so we put it in the bedroom because the cold winter air was coming through the walls and the meat didn't unthaw at night. Sometimes young couples, they go through some tough times. And that's exactly what the wilderness was for them. It was a time of adjustment. It was a time of hardship. It was tough, but you know what? She was young. And it was the kindness of her youth, meaning she was willing to overlook the inconveniences. And the reason was because she was in love. And because she was so in love with her husband, God the Father, she was willing to overlook the fact that they didn't have running water all the time, didn't have indoor plumbing, didn't have a grocery store around the corner, and it didn't matter because of the kindness of her youth. In verse number two, the Bible tells us that God also remembered the love of their espousals, and that's simply pointing to not just the intimacy that they enjoyed in their marriage, but it, what it's really pointing to is the fact that they, the joy that they experienced just from being alone with each other. Do you know what is so great about a honeymoon? And by the way, when I give premarital counseling, they never listen to me, but I tell them all the same thing, and that is, Go easy and light on the wedding and splurge on the honeymoon. The reason is because the wedding is practically nothing. The honeymoon is everything. And why is that? Because on a honeymoon, you don't have a job to go to. You don't have appointments to keep. There's no cooking, no cleaning. It's just two people who are so much in love with each other that nothing else matters. Again, in verse number two, God, rem God remembered when his wife used to follow him around all the time. Do you, do you know what newlyweds sometimes like to do, especially if they didn't grow up in the same town? They like to travel and show their, their new spouse where they used to live while they were growing up or where they used to play sports, or where they used to do this or that, and they would share stories with, uh, with each other, and they're helping each other to know them and to, to discover nice things about each other. Looking at the time in the wilderness, they would look at, sometimes you'll read as, as they're going through the wilderness journeys, they stayed here, and then they moved to here, they moved to here, they moved to here, they moved to here. And it looks like it's such a headache. Why can't they stay in one place? You know what I was kind of thinking? Because this was God's honeymoon, I think he was kind of enjoying taking the places and showing, I made that. I created this. Look what I did over here. And during this whole time, God is showing off to Israel, what he was capable of doing. And then in verse number three, God again thinks back to how wonderful their honeymoon was in the wilderness, and then whispers one of the greatest compliments of all. He tells his wife that she was his holiness. Well, what exactly does that mean? The word holy means something that is so special that it has been set aside just for God. If you had to go out and get something for God, what would you get? I mean, he is so special. How could you give him anything that would matter that would have any kind of a wow factor to it? What God is telling his wife is, you are my holiness. You are the most special thing in this world to me. I could have chosen anybody in the world. 
But honey, I chose you because you're the only one for me. God had fallen so deep in love with her. He wanted to spend the rest of eternity with her. And the reason was she was his holiness. He had chosen her and deliberately set her aside because she was more special than anybody else. When God looked at Israel, she was the love of his life. The second thing that we're going to find in the rest of the chapter, notice how brief that section was. Verses 2 and 3, referring to the time in the wilderness. And now the rest of the chapter, unfortunately, is going to detail and describe his greatest heartache. We all know that when a married couple end up getting a divorce, it's not just because of one thing. We also know in this matter of divorce that it didn't happen overnight. A divorce of two people who once loved each other very deeply. It's brought about by a series of things that over time just kind of added up, created bigger and bigger issues. And God's relationship with his wife Israel is no exception. So where did God's marriage take a turn for the worse? I mean, here we find on their honeymoon, God and Israel, they're so in tune with each other. Where do you ever find in the wilderness God's people going out and working jobs? Where do you read about their building businesses? They weren't making a living. For 40 years, they were being captivated by God's presence. And they saw the hand of God moving constantly. And for 40 years, they were in awe of God. But something happened along the way. When did Israel's love for God the Father begin to die? Amazingly, it happened when they left the hardships of the wilderness and when they entered a time of prosperity. Have you ever heard the term a trophy wife? That refers to a younger, beautiful woman who is married to an older man, and she is viewed as somewhat of a status symbol for him. She is something that he is always bragging about and showing off with. But have you ever wondered where a trophy wife comes from? It comes from that same man who married his high school sweetheart. And that man fell out of love with his wife, became convinced that he could do better than her. And as he became more successful in life, she no longer fits with his new image of himself. And so that man dumps his wife so that he can find somebody who is more fitting with his new image. And for those who have the ego and the money, that trophy wife syndrome happens over and over and over again. And that is exactly what happened to God's marriage to Israel, except she was the one who was looking for a trophy husband because she outgrew God. He wasn't fitting in her image as she viewed herself as they entered the land of Canaan. She had her head turned and swayed. Somebody else caught her eye. And that's when Israel decided to walk away from her first love. In chapter 2, verse 7, notice this. And I brought you, now this is the beginning of the complaint, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered... You defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. What God is saying is, wasn't the honeymoon sweet? Didn't we have a great time back in the wilderness? 
But as soon as we crossed that Jordan River and you stepped into that land of plenty, that's when you changed. That's when you started growing distant from me. As soon as the wife left the challenges of the desert, where she was forced to rely upon God as her husband, she then entered into the promised land, and her response was, Wow, look at all of this. Look at all that I've been missing. I was stuck in the wilderness all that those decades, and, but now look at how bountiful and, and plenty there is here. And the more that she looked around, the more that she began to also notice some good-looking guys. Well, who were these good-looking guys? They were the false gods, the gods of the Philistines, the gods of the Amorites, Baal. Wow, he sure would be a catch. And look at Molech. There are so many good-looking guys over here. And look who I'm stuck with. God the Father. The more that she prospered, the more of a wandering eye Israel developed. And this was the beginning of a broken heart for God. And it was also the beginning of an ugly transformation of a once beautiful woman into a spiritual slut. Throughout the rest of this chapter, God's going to use Jeremiah to paint a variety of pictures, portraits, as to how his wife was changing. And so many times when a person gets backslidden, they become blinded to how they, they look to other people. Godly individuals can look at a, a backslidden person and they can see that they're not living right. But that backslider, they feel that they're doing all right. They, they don't feel that they've changed at all. And in hopes of bringing his wife back, God is going to use Jeremiah to paint some portraits of how his wife has changed. In verse number 11, Jeremiah paints a portrait trying to help God's wife Israel see herself because she is just like a bankrupt businessman. In verse 11, hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory, which was God, for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. No businessman is going to stay in business as long as they keep making bad business decisions that constantly lose money. They're going to go bankrupt. They're going to, they're going to go broke. God is looking at his wife as a person who continues to make bad and horrible decisions that are transforming her into spiritual bankruptcy. He's even asking the question, who ever heard of a person taking something of enormous value and trading it for something that's worthless. Who's ever heard of that happening? And yet, his wife is now trading him in for false gods. And he's looking at her like, are you kidding me? You're willing to give me up for one of them? Who is that foolish? Who ever heard of a person getting rid of a clean, pure spring of water and trading it in for contaminated water that you'd get out of a toilet? Nobody in their right mind's going to do that. And yet God was her spring of pure water, 
And she was willing to set him aside and start drinking out of a filthy, contaminated system of idolatry in the land of Canaan. Who in the world is dumb enough to do that? The answer was his wife. Verse number 14, Jeremiah now is told to paint another picture of God's wife. This time she is described and portrayed as a helpless slave. Verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled. And they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the children of Noph and Tathanes have been bro- have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? In that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? By forsaking her husband and chasing after the false gods of Canaan, Israel has now become nothing more than a slave to her sinful pleasures. And the result was everyone was taken advantage of. Everyone was pursuing after Israel because they wanted to rob her blind. She was helpless, and yet in verse 17, God reminds her, this is all your fault. You've done this to yourself. Verse number 20, the third portrait that Jeremiah is told to paint now, God's wife is like a runaway dog. Verse 20, for of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou sayest, I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. The matter of the yoke is a matter of control. The owner is supposed to own the dog, not vice versa. In the dog world, there are certain breeds that seem to have been born with itchy feet and the skill of Houdini. In other words, there are certain dogs that just love to run away. Out of the top eight breeds, bloodhounds are number two, blue tick coon dogs are number five, black and tan coon dogs come in number seven. Kind of makes you wonder if Elvis Presley wasn't right when he's saying, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Because what he was saying was his girlfriend had itchy feet, a wandering eye, and she could not help but do things behind his back. So which dog came in number one? Never heard of this breed before, but it's something called the Anatolian Shepherd. It's a huge dog from Turkey. It was bred to guard sheep from wolves and cheetahs. It weighs about 150 pounds. It was deliberately bred to be independent and strong-willed, and the reason was this. It was supposed to be able to guard sheep without a human being being in the picture. Totally independent. It was rough and tough. It could take on a wolf. It could chase off a cheetah. But... It came at a price because when people were around, it was a different story. So what does the owner of an Anatolian shepherd have to look forward to? The dog has a mind of its own. It's determined to win whatever game that the owner tries to make it play. And here's the thing, and it's in its blood. It runs away from home between two and three times every month. When trying to describe what Israel, his wife, had become once she got into the land of Canaan, God's kind of painting a portrait like she's a dog that you cannot trust, and as soon as you turn your back, she's gone. Verse 21, Jeremiah sits down to paint yet another picture, and that is God's wife was just like a weed. Verse 21, yet I planted thee a noble vine. Holy, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? If you've ever lived in the South or driven through the South, you've probably noticed 
acres of trees that are covered completely by a vine that totally takes over not just the tree, but an entire patch of woods. It's called the kudzu. And its nickname is the vine that ate the south. It's the fastest growing killer vine in the nation. It grows faster than they can kill it. It outpaces herbicides that are trying to destroy it by taking over 2,200 acres every year. But the weird thing is that it looks kind of impressive. It is overwhelming to see these giant trees and a large wooded area totally covered with kudzu. But on the flip side, while it looks impressive, it kills what it clings to. It is a deadly force as far as the trees are concerned, and that's exactly what God sees in his wayward wife. She is poison. Verse 22, another portrait Isaiah is painting with words is the fact that God's wife, Israel, is just like a tattoo that you can't hide. Verse 22, for though thou wash me with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. As millions of people continue to get body tattoos, a lot of them have been running into problems, especially when it's time to get a job. And the reason is because, especially when they got all these tattoos on the face, not every employer is too excited about hiring a tattooed person, because that person's going to be representing their business. And there's some people, they don't think that's fair, and they're willing to holler discrimination. Some have even filed lawsuits because of that. I think it's always amusing to, to hear that some celebrity is, is, is broadcasting or advertising or showing off the latest tat that they got. But then when it's time to make money and make a movie, then a makeup artist always has to come in and hide the tattoo so that they can play whatever role they're supposed to be playing and hide it from the people buying tickets to the movie. But here's the thing that God is, is telling his people. Your sins have marked you, and you're not hiding them. I can see the marks of what you're doing as plain as day. Verse number 23, God described, is describing now his wife in a totally different fashion. And that is, in verse 23, his wife was just like an animal in heat. Verse 23, how canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways. A wild ass used, in the, used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they shall find her. In order for his unfaithful wife to get the message of what she really looks like. God is referring to two different animals, portraying his wife as either or both. The dromedary is referring to a young female camel. And what God is saying is, you're willing to run around in circles in the desert, trying to find somebody that will show you some attention. You're just like a donkey doing exactly the same thing. And here's, here's the crazy thing. If Israel, as a wife, would have lived, lived in this day and age, she would have fit right in. Because our, so, our society has become so perverted and twisted in what we view as being normal, Immorality is the norm now. And this type of immoral person, they think nothing of their behavior 
And the reason is because that is how the world is living. That is how the world does. It is natural. And you know what? Unfortunately, that's true. Doesn't mean that it's right, but it is normal. Verse number 26. Jeremiah paints yet another picture. God's wife is just like a bumbling thief. Verse 26, as the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed, they, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to his stock, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face, but in the time of their trouble they will say, arise and save us. One burglar in England broke into a home after they after the couple who lived there left for a holiday, as he broke into the house, instead of grabbing valuables, he realized that he had the house to himself, and so he decided to stay longer, make himself home. He bought groceries, fixed himself a meal, cleaned the house, even took time to wash his underwear before he decided it's time to take a nap. Well, he was awoken from his nap because the couple came home unexpectedly. He was not only embarrassed, he was also arrested. James Blankenship was 22 years old. He was out living on his own, but he decided to rob his own mother's house in broad daylight. He slipped in through a window, started rummaging around, making too much noise. When, it, when he had been discovered, he immediately jumped out the window tried to escape, he was later caught, and his first words to the police were, I thought you could only be arrested for burglary if it was at nighttime. The question at this point is, how could anybody be that stupid? And that's exactly what God is asking his wife when he is continually catching her in her ongoing affairs with idolatry. Verse number 29 Yet another portrait being painted. This time, God's wife is being portrayed as a rebellious child. Verse 29, wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. In this passage, the wife resembles a destroying lion and lords or masters. Both the lion and the aristocratic lord both view themselves as being answerable to no one. The lion kills its prey and then stands over it and roars, telling the world that it fears no one, for it's the king of the jungle. The aristocratic lord or the self-made man refuses to bend the knee before God, for he sees himself as the king of his own domain, and he roars of his own approval and independence. God's wife had also become uh, had also come to the place where she was misindependent. She could live and do as she pleased, and she didn't have to answer to anybody, not even her husband. Verse number 36, the last portrait tonight. She was just like a prisoner of war. Verse 36. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou wast ashamed of Assyria. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him, and thine hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. The final picture that God is trying to show his wife, why she looks so foolish, is because she keeps on making bad decisions, bad choices, 
And she keeps ending up on the wrong side from where God's at. It's as if she's locked into a war of rebellion. She trusted the Assyrians, but they let her down. She trusted the Egyptians for her safety and welfare, but they too were humiliated in defeat. And now she walks past God the Father, her husband, her hands raised on her head, just like a POW on a death march. She has been defeated, she's been humbled, and she's now being led to an uncertain future. But why? Why all of the misery and the heartache? Why is all this necessary? Well, an even greater question is, why does God still love her? Why does he still put up with you and I? The answer to both is because he just loves us. And one day, God's people will be able to love him back as he deserves to be loved. Let's bow for prayer. Father, would you please bless each and every person this evening. And and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would allow our eyes to be open.